What's going on, guys? I just realized I made a mistake. All right, let's check this out. What's going on? Thanks for joining me this Friday. I hope you guys have had a good week. I have had a really, really good week myself. Uh, this was Jay Powell speaking, actually. Um, this has been a very interesting week coming off of Thanksgiving. I hope everyone had a good one. Hey, what's up, Stone Pilot? Uh, welcome to the people on Trading View, the YouTubes, and the Discords. So, yeah, last week I did do a stream because it was uh, time to eat uh, and be merry. I hope everyone had a good one. Uh, I had a fr deep fried turkey and a smoked turkey, so uh, it was a very good Thanksgiving. And I had to, a lot to be thankful for this year. Um, I've learned a lot. Well, that's the good way to put it. A lot of people, I think, have been hurting this year. But me, at least, I've been able to really get my feet back from under me trading, uh, especially in the futures. Uh, right now, the VIX is still holding around 20. Now, VIX is a representation of movement. And as long as the VIX stays up above 20, there's some really good trading opportunities to day trade that money back. But as we start to uh, get back below 20, you can start to see uh, the VIX starting to get right down there, that support. So something's about to break. We've got uh, the market at a resistance right now. We've got VIX at a support. And I'm really going to miss the days of having all this good volatility to trade because it's really helped me claw my way back through this year um, doing day trading opportunities. And there's been a lot this week. I'm going to spend the, the better part of the beginning of the live stream uh, talking about uh, the NASDAQ a little bit because honestly, that's been the most interesting. Uh, I probably will you know, get to talking about um, crypto, FTX, uh, SBF, as it were. I mainly, if you guys have an opinion about them, please feel free to share. Uh, I'm going to give my opinion about it. Uh, it's, of course, going to be a contrarian opinion that I, I've kind of shared with some people that I know. And um, it doesn't really uh, come through. Yeah, can you hear me, Jen? Can you hear me okay on uh, Discord? Okay, good. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we're, I'm going to talk about the market here and the resistance is that. Yep. So let, let's jump into that real quick. Um, do a quick market recap. Look at this week's trades because there's been a lot of good opportunities uh, for trading the equity, futures, NASDAQ, and ES. And that's what I've been working on now. I was, I was talking to someone last night uh, at a Bitcoin meetup about how every year I do a little bit something different. And if you think about it, the market is different every year. Last year, the beginning of the year, January, you had meme stocks, and that was the big uproar, and also EV stocks, and eventually those go away. You can't trade that way anymore. I was able to capture a little bit of that meme stock madness. It was the most shorted stocks. It was short squeezes. Uh, but that was only for the first part of the year. Uh, then oil was the big trade, and that's fallen off. And this year, it's had its own sort of characteristic. Uh, nobody expected it, but it was the dollar. But futures have been very, very good with this heightened volatility. There's been a lot of back and forth act action that, you know, it looks kind of crazy. If you zoom out to the daily, it's like, well, there's no trend here. But if you get down to a daily basis, you can definitely find something. And I want to go through some of the things that have been clear to me, so hopefully they can be clear to you as well, because I want to teach. I want to people to learn the the skills that I've had to develop over the years that have brought me back from failure. Because trading is about you know wins and lo lo losses, and it's about adapting and getting better with each iteration. I'm very critical of my trades. I mean, I made I had a great week this week. Honestly, I had a great week, but I sit here going back and looking what I could I could have done better. So I'm going to kind of go through those thoughts with you guys uh, today for the better part of the beginning part. 
And uh, then, of course, we'll, we'll get into the crypto because usually about later on to the live stream, more people uh, start to filter in. I think that's going to interest people uh, a lot more. Uh, quick plug so that Jen doesn't uh, get on to me too much. I do have a Discord. It is free. I don't charge people. I don't teach classes. I just want to talk to people. So um, check the links below. And uh, that's plug number one. I really just like to have a community going. And right now, no matter where you go, trading community-wise, um, the the... The activity is down. Not, you know, I've got a nice little close group of friends that I talk to on a daily basis, and I really, really enjoy that. And uh, if everyone uh, is disinterested because people aren't making big money, it's a lot more exciting when people are making big money, no doubt about it. Um, but if you, know, you want to come and talk about some things now while things are uninteresting, it's kind of a sign. It really is. I mean, I went to a, a Bitcoin meetup. It's the same Bitcoin meetup I've been going to uh, since 2013. That was when it was founded. And we definitely, definitely last night had a bear market turnout. Um, it's funny, through all these cycles of Bitcoin, going back to 2013, the, the really, you can tell where the market's at by how many people come. I mean, I smoked uh, pork butt and uh, sirloin roast um, you know, again, we don't charge for it. It's just kind of like a social thing for us. And w when a bear market comes and we, you start to get at a, you know, the lows that you see, you know, here, when you, when you start around the top, of course, and even in the forties, uh, our meetups would have, you know, close to a hundred people, huge, huge turnouts. Um, but as the market comes down last night, uh, we probably had about it was less than 20, anywhere from like 12 to 20 people, honestly. And it's always the same faces. It's funny. We, we get down to this little nucleus of, you know, really close uh, long-term friends that uh, have been getting together to meet and talk about the current state of things. And it's it's not a very accurate indicator, but it's it's pretty indicative of where the market is at. And I've just seen it so many times over the years. Um, yeah, it's it's almost as it. Well, I think it's probably a better indicator of a top when there's a bunch of people there, because bear markets can last a long time, and we'll be there by ourselves for a while. But uh, yeah, when we start to get a really good turnout, that's about the time you want to start selling. So that's for thought during uh, the next next cycle. So all right, always uh, if you got any questions. Uh, if you got any symbols to look at, post them in the chat. I love to look at new stuff. I'm going to give you my opinion. You may not like it if you're super long it, if you're if I tell you it's bearish, but it is my honest opinion. And I try to be really honest because uh, truth is going to make money. It's not narratives. And I was on a live stream yesterday with uh, Splick, uh, Steven, at uh, TradingView, and uh, we had a really good talk. Um, I wonder if I can find that real quick. We had a really great uh, talk about some of my methods. He's a really good uh, host, I would say, too. Um, I look forward to doing with it again. Let's, uh, let's do a look for people, trading view. Yep, right there at the top. And he's been trying to do, they have been doing a lot of uh, Spanish-speaking um, streams. But, uh, yeah, it's this one right here at the top, talking to me. Um, yeah, so go and check that out if you want a little more content. I, I really got a chance to talk about my thoughts about uh, the best time of day to trade. And one of the things that I really uh, tried to touch on when he asked me the question, what do you think traders should be looking at going into the future? And my answer to that is, it was really just kind of off the cuff, stay away from narratives. You know, one of the things that I've really harped on uh, this year has been how last year cash was trash. Even Ray Dalio was saying that uh, you had to buy assets because your dollar was going to get inflated away uh, by the Fed's money printing. But ironically, the dollar was one of the best things that you could have coming into this year. And people will say, wow, you know, it's inflation. Well, but here's the thing. Inflation of maybe stuff that you buy, but when it comes to assets like stocks and crypto or particularly foreign currencies, you can now today buy more of the stuff with your dollars. And so dollars have been worth more. But that was not what people thought. It was not intuitive with inflation 
about to and truly going to run really hot. Now, someone asked me on the live stream yesterday, like, what do you think is going on with the dollar? Well, of course, they're going to ask that because it's been doing a pullback, and that's what it is. You had this big, long move, and I got this box here for a reason. Uh, probably talked about it in the weeks past, but it was really, I, I know I talked about it because that's where I would have drawn this. This uh, this little hesitation here, it's not any kind of double top. It's not any kind of you know head and shoulders, but it's coming around that time in October where we start to see you know the uh, the inflation uh, numbers, the CPI start to come down a little bit. People are pricing in. This, this is my belief right now. This is my narrative. People, the market is beginning to price in. Maybe not the end of inflation, maybe not the end of interest rates rising, but def I think they're trying to price in the decrease in acceleration of interest rates rising, maybe even ceasing interest rates going up. I don't know, but all this while that the dollar's been going up is because it's forward-looking that interest rates are going to go up. If interest rates kind of stay at one place, then like any price chart, this is going to be an overreaction. So what the dollar is doing now, however you want to look at it, is a pullback to a bullish trend. And like any trend that's doing a pullback, I'm looking for the DXY, the dollar index in particular, come back to 102. I've been talking about the dollar yen for uh, several weeks now since it did this little spike here back in October. Um, this was a combination of the inflation, excuse me, the, uh, yeah, the inflation number and the Bank of Japan. I can't remember exactly what they did. I'm not a big news guy. I just look at the chart and I know something happened. And I think that the, the dollar yen is doing the same thing, except this would be the instrument that I would like to trade. It's probably going to come down to uh, 127, 128, something like that. Still going. So that's what I'm looking at in the terms of the dollar. But as far as the, uh, the equity markets go, got it circled here. I'll clean up things. We're done for the day. So... This is so key, and this is my strategy. This is the spikes that I like to look for. Uh, this is the October uh, CPI print, and that was where we were expected to get 8.3% CPI. Instead, we got 8.2%. I know, tiny difference, probably within the margin of error, but that was what signaled, okay, maybe this whole thing is over to the market. I don't know if that's true. The market's not always right, but it's forward-looking. And so this rise we've been getting is, is part of the whole sinusoidal nature of this year where dip buyers are getting punished every once in a while. And it's the bottom of this particular cycle, but there's a reason there. It was that news event that spiked down below that prior low that it set in early October, faked everyone out to the downside, and up it has gone. This week was interesting. I said every week, but it's interesting because you can you can chart this stuff. You can find levels. And that's why I like to do these live streams and talk to people and share it on Discord is because I I want people to be able to kind of understand what I've come to see. And it's taken a long time, but once you see it, I hope that people can begin to see it again and again, not just in the market, but also in other instruments, price instruments, and then trade and invest better. And what we've got going on right now with the NASDAQ is the other tenant, the other tenant of my trading philosophy, which is looking for 50% retracements to major trends. That major trend being the August high in the NASDAQ, which was also a high in the equities, they, or excuse me, ES, S&P 500. Um, you'll see I flip back and forth a lot between the ES, the S&P mini futures, and the NASDAQ futures. And that's because I'm look, those are the two things that I'm looking at on a daily basis going back and forth. They, they move together. They're very correlated, but they have certain divergences. Like, for instance, typically, if you want to take a long in this market, I want to quantify that. This is just recent. If you want to take a long, you're better off taking it in the ES because the ES has a more of a tendency to break resistances and the NASDAQ has more of a tendency to hold resistances. That's just what's going on right now. And the opposite is true. Bearish trades on the NASDAQ tend to give you just more. And 
whereas the S&P 500 tends to come down to those supports, hold, and that's where you basically stay at. And that really came into play this week because uh, the big trade I had on Tuesday was a long ES, and the big trade last yesterday uh, into today was a short on the NASDAQ. And it worked. So what you've got going on right now, though, is you have the NASDAQ coming up to a high from August. Then you have that, of course, October spike low. And now it's come back to do what a lot of people will see as a double top on the uh, daily chart. And that's what it basically hit yesterday. And yesterday was an excellent, excellent opportunity because you had this, um, what was it? It was a GDP number. You had some news come around uh, at 8.30, which gave a spike in fact, you had a double-sided spike, but a lot of volatility here at the open, which could let me set up a trade, which I'm going to go through when I go through a chronology of this week. And uh, then you had a pullback, and where did that pullback go to? Well, it came down and, of course, held today that 50% level of j speaking on Wednesday. J this, this move up right here was Jerome uh, coming in and being more dovish, uh, talking about how... Uh, Possibly they're going to start slowing down if certain criteria are met, which the market took as, you know, woo bye-bye. looks pretty bullish to me, honestly, because we held this level. Um, just following that we held this level on uh, Tuesday as well, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, but like always, if you guys have questions, um, as I'm kind of rattling off my thoughts, and my thought process stopped me because I kind of get on rants and just kind of keep going, which I've been really happy that TradingView's uh, technology has been working really well. Uh, I haven't gotten interrupted. But, uh, hey, Stone Polly, you're still there? Give me a thumbs up if you are because you're kind of my bellwether. I just want to make sure that chat and TradingView is, uh, is working just fine. So, yeah. Yeah, Jen, I don't know what happened to the SPACs. I think that was just a 2021 phenomenon. All right, good. Excellent, excellent. All right, so what I want to do is go back through uh, the equities. Um, look at his chart. Okay, I'll look at his charts right now because I don't want to forget. All right, CLAA, um, Colonnade Acquisition Corp. Uh, there's not much here for me to chart. I think you need to just believe in the story. Death. Oh, are you respecting death? Eh, it's coming up to 10. That's a nice number. Yeah, I don't I don't see anything here, man. There's not much for me to do here. Um, so uh Nasdaq. Okay. Uh no. S&P 500. So, as I said, really from October in through here, you got to assume bullish. I'm sort of I'm not I'm weakly convicted that this thing should continue and I'm really saying that because I really want to see it come to maybe it's like a little level here maybe a level here or this could be the top the reason I'm starting to get a little top wary here even though it's been very bullish this week is because just as you're coming to a yeah this is this is my thoughts about the VIX that I posted today just as you're coming to this resistance, you know, the 50% on the NASDAQ of the August high to the October low, you're also getting to a support on VIX volatility. And these two things are very often inversely correlated. In fact, sometimes you can time market tops and bottoms on a you know, swing basis based upon the VIX. And so we're coming to a really clear level at 20 VIX. So just as the market is coming up to a resistance, you're having an, the inverse uh, derivative of that, the volatility index, coming to a support. Something's going to happen. And I know I'm, it's a binary thing. It can either you know turn around, which means stocks go down, VIX goes up. Or if the market starts to grind up, like if we get a Santa Claus rally, then so volatility is going to start to go down and we're going to break through that level. So we're at a real decision point right now going into next week. This is the first week, first full week coming up of, of December. And I remember last year there was a big joke because Kramer, 
uh, started talking about the Santa Claus rally. People made fun of him, and of course, because he was talking about it, it didn't happen. Uh, I'm curious if he's going to say anything about it uh, this time. Something tells me that he may not. He may hold off on that because people gave him so much crap about it. So, all right. Let's look at the S&P 500 this week. So, this week started pretty bearishly. So, let's go back and take a look at this. We're going to look at the 30-minute first. And this is coming into Sunday night. I don't trade Sunday night, but I will wait and look. Uh, for a trade coming into um, coming into 9:30 here on uh, Monday, uh, is the screen supposed to be black certified? Um, it shouldn't be. It should not be. Um, ever, anyone else on Trading View having an issue? Let me see. On my screen, I see it. Maybe try to refresh. Try to refresh the uh, the page. I've still got it up actually on my screen. I have. Okay, so it works for some people. Works for doesn't. Man, when I worked in tech support, I really hated it when that happened. When things just did. I like I like it when things just break. When things just break, you can just fix them. Try try to refresh, guys, and uh, let me know if uh, it's coming through still. All right. If some people are seeing it, I'm going to chat. Refresh fixed it? Okay. If you're having a problem, refresh the chat. Or refresh, excuse me, refresh the screen. All right. So going into Monday was a day of patience. Great patience. But I knew coming into uh, this week that I, kn well, I didn't know anything coming this week, excuse me. Let's just exercise patience. Uh, so Monday, we come into, where's 9.30? Yeah, 9.30 happens, and we get this run up here. I usually look for some kind of a spike or opportunity, but really Monday, I just sat back and uh, waited. There was really nothing to be done, at least among my estimation. You know, I'm always sitting here looking at a trend like this You know, that happened on Monday, wishing, oh, man, I wish I would have had an opportunity to get in, but... You know, I look for very specific setups. I mean, I've, as I've said to people, um, people try to get me to scalp, and I am not a scalper. I'm not a scalper because it requires total lack of emotionality. I'm very emotional about things, as people can know when they read you know, me talk about how critical I am uh, on Discord. But the way I get around that emotionality is I am patient and I have rules. I wait for my setups to happen. And so what we had happening here on Tuesday, come in just like every day. I'm watching it from about 8.30 if there's news. Definitely here at the open. And so we have the open here on Tuesday. The open here on Tuesday, we got about 9.30. Let's go down to the one minute because during 8.30 till about noon, I'm going to be watching the one minute. And then I have a rule. I start looking at the five minute afterwards. Uh, into the afternoon because that's going to clear up a lot of the noise that's typically going to happen in the afternoons, the zombie time. And so as we're coming through here, there's no trades. I'm sitting here reading the news, arguing with people online that are wrong because they need to be told, and keeping an eye on the chart. And so as we come in to the la later part of the morning, we do get a little sell-off. And this is a big move here. This is a big move on the ES that anyone would like to be in short, good 22-point move, there's some good money there. But nothing in here really triggered my setups, the setups I like to see, which I'm going to you know, basically talk about. The t both the things I really like to play happened this week. That's why it's been such a cool week. And so, and by the way, all this stuff, I love to talk about it in real time in the future chat on my Discord. Um, so... We come into this little event right here. Okay, here's what's critical about this. We have this big bearish trend, and I am a contrarian. I just assume that everybody's wrong. 
And sometimes I assume everybody's wrong so much that I'm wrong. Uh, I liked, I've been starting to say that I'm a contrarian contrarian, that I, I hang around with so many contrarians that when they start saying this narrative, I just have to think it's wrong, and that ends up, ends up making me a normie. I end up taking the consensus of the mainstream inadvertently. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but it, it, it really I'm thinking in terms of like crypto, where everyone thought back last year, in the fall of last year, that they were the true contrarians, to the mainstream narrative that, you know, the dollar was okay. I mean, oh, oh you just don't understand Bitcoin, bro. You know, Bitcoin's going to replace the dollar. Cool story, bro. You know, I, I heard that, and they thought they were being contrarian, but really they were the mainstream of their little niche. And uh, that was not right. Anyway, rant off. Where are we here? We're at a key, key point on trading, day trading. Here's what's going on. So from 9.30, the U.S. market opens. The Europe mar European market, the London market, has been open since about 4 a.m. Eastern time. So from about here, you'll notice how there's really not much going on, and then Europe comes online, our, our time, my time, East Coast, 4 a.m., and then you actually get some movement during the Euro session. You know, this is the Euros making their day trading money. And then you have this real big sweet spot. Notice how the bars even get bigger. The bars even get a lot bigger. There's a lot more movement from the open, really and truly, from 10 a.m. to about 11.30. Why? 11.30 is when those markets close, when those markets go offline. So what you want to do is want to look for when 11.30 comes around. Once you start watching this, if you're day trading charts, even if you're doing crypto, watch for this 11.30 timing element, either the market open, 10 a.m. or 11.30 when Europe goes offline. Because you got to think about it, in this morning session, from 9.30 until 11.30, you have both the U.S. session and you have the European session. Both people are trading actively. You have the most volume during that time of the day, the most chance for real trades and trends. But even if you miss it, that 11.30 timing can be really, really critical. It can be a critical change in the market. It can be a critical point of reversal. So every 11.30, if I've, even, if I've missed a trade, if I've missed a big, juicy move in the market because it didn't fit my rules, I'm not mad because I know I got one more shot. I got one more shot. And so you had the 1130 timing element coming up. Now, if I draw a line where we are, which I would have done in my morning research, and then zoomed out to the big picture, not the five-minute, maybe the 30-minute, or even maybe the two-hour, so that I can really get a bigger picture of where I am in the broad scope of the month of November, as it were, we can start to see, let's clean those up a little bit. We can see where we are. We're at a major support that held for at least two weeks during the middle of November, one day, two day, three day, four day. That was a major point that's been held, and now we're coming to that point at the end of trading, the overlap trading on Tuesday. So I'm very, very keen to watch for this level as we're coming into this time period. And then we got sort of like my trigger. This red line is, it comes from Ichimoku. It is the nine period Tinkinson. It's not a moving average, it's a moving median, because I do everything based on 50%. What this tells me is the 50% of the last nine bars. And so from this little inversion point right here, you see how this little level went flat? That's what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find just these the flat points, the points of 50% that really matter in the short term for that really close, low-risk entry. Notice how when you had this top up here 
and then it made this reaction there, price held that 50%. That's big. That's big. But this is not the trade I took because really I didn't have enough movement down here. This was not a trade that I took using that strategy because let's just say that, let's go back and look at it in context. So we get a little run up here. I'm thinking contrarian. I'm thinking I want to short it. So I'm going to look at that 50%. I'm going to chart out my trade. I want to make sure that my stop clears that high because then the trend's continuing. It just is. That's what I assume. But then I want to pick a target. And so what I really need to do is I need to find a 50% level of whatever I'm trying to play a pullback to. And I'm going to look for that to give me a target down there. Now, this is a trade, but it's not a good trade. And why it's not a good trade is because I have strict rules around reward and risk. So reward is 1.56 times the risk. I'd be risking four points to try to make about six and a half, 6.25 points. That's not good. I'm wrong a lot like any trader. I assume that I don't know what's going to happen. I assume that every trade that I put on is probably going to lose. They don't all lose, but as long as I make more on my winners, a substantial amount more, I'll be okay. And then I can worry about being more right. But the first thing I need to make sure of is that a winner is going to make up for more than one or two losers. And so I want a three to one risk reward ratio. Now, if I wanted to be aggressive in this trade, what I could have done was maybe try to play back to the low. That would have gotten it to me. And this would actually have worked. But I'm a little more conservative. That's just the way I am. And so I'm looking for a 50% move, a 50% move back from whatever trade that I'm, or trend that I'm trying to play. So the difference here is that we got to a major level. Remember, this was that support from about two weeks prior. We get to that support add a timing element, and so now I'm watching for that trigger. I'm watching for price to get back above, close, boop, close above that red line, and then I want this red line to kind of go flat a little bit because what that's going to show me is it's going to show me, okay, where is the 50% of this recent pullback right here? Where is it? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look to take a long, off of that level, and remember, I can put my stop pretty close to the bottom because if it breaks it, this is a stronger than I expected. But the beauty of this is because this was such a meaty move, such a big move, I can find that 50% back up to 39.61, let's call it. 39.62 was actually what I ended up doing. And I can still get my 3 to 1 and clear this low. So this is a good trade. I don't know what's going to happen, but this is good. It is good. The reward risk is good. The timing is good. The setup is good. It's a trade that I have to take because it fits all my rules. And if I don't, I'm going to be a little upset with myself. It's what I've studied. It's why I'm sitting here for hours every day. This is my job. My job is to take good trades like this. Not to take trades because I feel like it, trade the opportunities that come. And this is a perfect opportunity. And so it triggers, it gets in, and now I'm sitting here waiting as we go into the zombie time. Now, the zombie time sucks. The zombie time is after Europe goes offline and people start going to lunch, 12 o'clock. Because what does this thing do? This thing just hangs out. And then it does something really annoying. It comes up and it doesn't take my limit order. But that's actually okay, because I had some meetings that I had to go to uh, this afternoon. But I left this trade on. I left my stop where it was. I left my first target, my first contract target, up at 62. And I did check my phone, as anyone's want to do, and saw that it missed my target. And you know, if I had been sitting here at the computer, I would have been really frustrated 
just like anyone else, to have come back down all the way from all that profit that I could have had. But I've learned to just leave it be. Here, think about it this way. Think about it this way. Let's go back. Let's go back a little bit. So when I put this trade on, when I put this trade on right here, and by the way, guys, if you have any questions, just uh, just let me know. When I put this trade on, let's just say that some news came out. J. Powell did an emergency press conference to say that he was retiring or or quitting because you know he'd had an affair with an intern or something crazy like that. And imagine that you had a big red bar that happened right here, and it stopped me out in the next second that I took that trade on. I was okay with that. I was cool with that. I had to be. I had to accept that that was entirely possible. If it happened, am I going to be mad? Yes. But it was possible. It could have happened within one minute. It could have happened within 30 minutes. It could have happened at any point. So, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I don't sit here and watch it and let my brain get a little uh, creative. Like, if you go through here and you're sitting here watching a one-minute chart and you're just letting the kind of the emotions flow through you, you're like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, 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 okay. Uh. You're going to sit here and stress yourself out trying to say, like, okay, seller's up here, buyer's down here. That's cool. You know, I, I'm not saying that I don't let that go through my head, but I've kind of tried to get past that and just let my trade play out. And so even though it didn't take my order, I actually had a distraction in the day. I just kind of left it alone. And then finally, I get the alert on my phone that it took my target. I just left the trade on to play out because I was cool with the risk from the beginning. I mean, could I have come in here and saw this do its little thing and maybe said, okay, that didn't make it, boom. Sure, I could have messed with it that way. Could I have messed with it down here when it was starting to get close to my entry? Maybe. Could I have trailed my stop? A lot of people do. I don't. I really don't believe in moving your stop up to break even. And the reason for that is because, well, let me, we're going to get into that in just a second. I don't believe in moving your stop to break even. I'm going to show you guys why from this week. Good example. Um, now, I did close this out uh, as the day ended, as it kind of did this little number right here and showed me it's just going to hang around. So basically, it came back up to around here in this chop right before the close, and I cut the last contract. But we're going to see what happened going forward a little bit. But just to kind of recap, you know, Monday I waited. Tuesday all morning I waited. I got this big move, and then finally Tuesday at 1130, all the things that I look for that I want to trade happened. I'm always frustrated when I don't see what I want to see any given minute. But I know after doing this for so long that eventually your setup is going to come. It's going to come. It may happen only once a week. If VIX starts getting in the low teens, it may only happen once a week. And then if VIX gets below 10, it's only going to happen once a month. But we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Let's let the evening session play out because I had considered leaving a contract on through the evening session, but I did not. I knew that the market was going to be waiting for uh, a Wednesday news. I think that, uh, what was on Wednesday? Wednesday this week at 8.15 was the ADP non-farm payroll and then the GDP. So I knew this news was coming out. And then you had at 1.30, uh, Jay Powell was going to talk what he was going to say. And so at about 8.15, you get this setup right here on Wednesday. I actually didn't take this setup. Um, this would have been decent. This would have been a pretty decent setup. Uh, the reason would have been because it was a spike on a news event. It broke this last high right here. But I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'll just be totally honest. Um, I did not get enough sleep the night before. I was not fresh. I've been a little worried about uh, this uh, condo renovation I've been working on. Uh, that's actually resolved now. 
that is actually resolved. I'm actually moving forward. There's a light in the tunnel. But uh, things were a little terse, we'll put it, this week. And uh, I didn't get enough sleep. You know, yesterday's live stream, uh, you know, Stephen asked me, I guess I'm just going to call him Stephen. He asked me, you know, what do you think about pajama traders, people that trade at 1, 2, 3 a.m. at night? Um, I just don't think that you're going to make good decisions at that time of night. Moreover, you're going to miss out on sleep, and sleep is really important to being fresh and making trading decisions. And uh, that's why I wasn't able to catch this news event. I just didn't feel fresh enough. I didn't trust enough, and uh, it turned out to work. But it was a valid setup on a spike. And then, of course, what happened was you come back down in the morning to this level right here. Now, remember, remember the trader that may have left on a contract and then moved his stop up to break even? Remember that guy? Okay, that example. Let's just look and see what happened. So again, we're coming into the morning, and boom, right before j -Pal speaks, if you had moved your stop up to break even, it would have taken it. What did you do? You basically gave up your long position at the level you bought it. You bought this long position because it was at a support. So you're telling me, I mean, hypothetically, if this is what, someone had done. If you had moved your stop up to break even off playing this low, you moved your stop up to the support. You sold at support. That's basically what you did by putting in a, uh, a stop order at your break even. You know, the market, you got to remember, I know you've heard it before, the market doesn't care about your P&L. The market doesn't care where your break even point is. It doesn't. It responds to news, levels, whatever you want to say. But if you took a trade at that level, you wanted it at that level. You wanted to buy at that level. You wanted to buy that level Tuesday, then you want to buy it at level Wednesday. Because if that is a level that it's going to hold, then it's going to hold. So this is why when people ask me, do you know, I move my stop up, blah, 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 I don't. Because what happens is I know I entered the trade for a reason, the reason being got to a level. So why would I want to close my trade out at a level? So, yeah. All right. j -Pal speaks, and he's dovish, and boom. If you would have moved your stop up to break even, you would have missed that. Now, there was, again, on Wednesday, an opportunity here. At this low point, remember at that low, you got that little Tinkinson, excuse me, red line, whatever you want to call it, inversion here. Remember that trade that I like to play? You had the, the move from the, uh, the morning down to about noon. Let me clean this up a little bit. There's your level. Remember, there's your Tuesday low, which is your month of November low, the red line. So you had that working for you. It came down to it. And you could have gotten a long, let's see, hold on, could you have gotten back up to that 50%? I may, this may be why I didn't take this. Yeah, look at that. That that would not, okay, that's, not only was I low on sleep, but I probably nixed this because of this reason right here. Because, look, this is only a 2.5. I try to be really stringent about my reward risk. That's what I try to do. So, um, yeah. But j -Pal comes in. Ah, uh, look at that. You had that uh, that little spike down. Thank everybody out. Happened so much. That's why I try to trade him. Interestingly enough, just kind of walk through this. Uh, it did a really quick... Let me take off the spike. You know the spike's there. It did a really quick pullback to the... 50% level of this spike to high right there. Boom. Bing. That was a good trade. If you want to play that news event. And then it does one more push up. Hmm. I wonder. I wonder if it's going to pull back to the 50% of that. Look at that. You had two opportunities at 50% to get up. I'm telling you this as, as you, but me also... Again, I'm not, I don't know if this is why I'm able to progress or if it keeps me from progressing, but I'm really critical of myself. And I'm sitting here very groggy just watching this transpire. I'm like, oh, that was a good trade. Oh, that was a good trade. 
I got to get better sleep. That's how I got to get better because these didn't really quite fit my rules for you know reversals. This is a trending strategy where you're going to play a 50% pullback as it goes along. But these were valid. These are valid for someone, if you're a very aggressive trader, a scalper maybe even, to take a look at something like this and be like, okay, j Powell says something, he's talking, the market's going up, let me buy on pullbacks, let me buy on pullbacks. Because you got these two opportunities at 50% levels at each little pump, it just worked. And then up it freaking goes. Jeremiah asked, do I like to use harmonics in my trading? Jeremiah, I really appreciate harmonics. I would say what I really focus on is sort of looking for fractal patterns. In other words, you know, what I'm playing is a 50% level, like a pullback inside like a minor trend, but I'm wanting to do that at maybe a level, a 50% level or a support resistance of the higher time frame. And so I, I remember many years ago I studied harmonics where you can kind of see like a trend that goes up and then on a wider trend scheme you see it do a little thing up. I've read about it, but I don't really use it, I would say. Uh, but I'm aware of it. And I kind of internalized some of the lessons of harmonic trading and the way I look at trying to combine the higher time frame with the lower time frame where I'm doing my trading. So that's to answer your question, Jeremiah. So, all right, yep, I'm going to look at uh, crypto here in just a second. I know like later, oh, it's almost later, an hour in. Okay, I've been talking about this. All right, let's, let's finish this up. So the coup de grace here was even after Wednesday, I'm not frustrated. I know why I didn't see it. We come into Wednesday, and right here at the open, we get a spike. We get a spike, but basically on both sides. Uh, this Thursday news was the CPI, CPI numbers. Incidentally, CPI uh, from December the 3rd, 2021, one year ago today, was what really signaled the crash in crypto. I talked about it at length, but nobody listened to me. We'll revisit that in a second. But this was really the, the good trade of the week. Ah, clean that up. So when this set up the 30-minute spike, it looks something like this. This was the the spike. Uh, it's a secondary spike where you basically pulled up over uh, that level, broke that level, and slammed back down. That is a short. It's a really clear, easy way to put your stop right above there. It tried to get it. It tried to get it. And then have your target down here at the 50%. Now, also incidentally, interestingly enough, uh, we saw an exhibit, exhibit, ex exhibition of the, um, the pattern that I've really come to like, which is the smile, the yum emoji. So as you see that there, if you see a yum emoji, that means there's a really juicy, tasty trade about to set up. So make sure that you pay attention to the, the yum emoji. Basically, you have a, a top here, an eye, a top here. A nice little neckline, but you got that little tongue sticking out. like. Uh. So there's that. And as that continued on, uh, it basically went around. I got a little naughty here. I didn't let that thing stop me out. And it went all the way to do nothing until this morning. All right, so are we going to get into this morning? I went to bed with this on because I had confidence. The reason I had confidence going into this thing was because, once again, we are at this 50% level on the NASDAQ. We already have a high hold to make this into a double top right here from Tuesday. Wait, that's Tuesday, November 15th, so Tuesday a few weeks ago. So as this thing's coming into uh, the AM hours, we've got some news coming up. we got the, the actual U.S. farm payrolls. I thought maybe that this thing would spike and go. It did. But uh, comes back down, able to take some profit. And uh, then today in the afternoon, as we started coming back up, I was able to close it uh, on this little pullback right here before we got this. I close it. Basically, you come back down to the 
50% of the move down. I took an additional short and some M and Q's, try to add to it here. And then of course they didn't work out. So we got the pullback to here, close it out flat for the week, long Tuesday, short Thursday, good week. So that's my weekly recap. Um, also was able to pick up by the way. Uh, and again, I post these as I'm doing them in, uh, the discord, um, MKTX, it had a spike. You can't see it here on TradingView, but Thinkorswim triggered it. Uh, it had a spike here at a 50% level. Um, and man, this is doing pretty well. Not to mention, MKTX has had a big, big, big bearish run. Um, but now it's actually gotten outside the daily cloud. And so that was another pickup for this week. Uh, Intel, um, sorry for, who was it, uh, Raj? Um, I cut my Intel this week. Um, Intel really got into my stop alerts and it came back up in here. Uh, I closed it today. I closed it today because it's already given me way too much pain and it really failed to get back up to the top. I'm out of the Intel trade. So it can go up, it can go down. Uh, but pretty much right now, this trade that I put on back on the 17th, uh, is done for me. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so those are really the two stock differences, stock trades that I did this week. I closed Intel, uh, took on uh, MKTX, and I was able to take some profit yesterday on Thursday when it came up to here. It's going to come up, retest the high. We'll see. Okay. Crypto, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Now, I made a post uh, a few weeks ago about Bitcoin. Uh, that hope was being kindled. I always use the daily chart with Ichimoku to really sort of uh, get a perspective on what Bitcoin is doing. Is it actually trending bullish? I actually got picked up by the editors on that because I think I was cute. So what was happening then a few weeks ago was Bitcoin had started to poke its head outside the cloud the Ichimoku daily cloud based on classic Ichimoku settings. I don't use those better crypto settings. You know why? Because I did the research to show me that they're not better. In fact, if you use the strategy of Ichimoku on the daily chart of Bitcoin, that strategy being two things need to happen for you to know what Bitcoin is doing and how you should be positioning it. Price gets above the cloud, and the lagging span, the chikao, probably pronouncing that wrong, or momentum, as it's often called in, I think, trading view, when it gets out of the cloud too, when it gets out, go. Buy some Bitcoin. But only do it then. Only when you have that confirmation. The inverse is also true. The inverse is true in that right around, you remember when I said the the December jobs report. We had that G December jobs report on December 3rd, 2021. It was showing, uh, I don't even remember what it said, but it's so it was so weird that a jobs report, a U.S. jobs report, would have an effect on cryptocurrency. I mean, nobody actually works for Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is not tied to the economy. In fact, I was assured all through tw 2021 that it was a completely uncorrelated asset. But I noticed when Bitcoin and Ethereum, Ethereum did the same thing, responded to some sort of interest rate news, which is what the jobs report was, the Fed was going to look, be looking at jobs to know if they should raise rates or not. When this happened, Bitcoin sold off, and it should have been a warning sign to everyone that now crypto was becoming correlated with the inflation adjustments, or excuse me, um, interest rate adjustments that the Fed was doing. I'm talking about ancient history now, though. It's already happened. We already know what happened from that point. We already know that it never recovered. But you knew, based on Ichimoku, you knew based on an analysis of the trend that price had gotten below the cloud, momentum had as well. You were okay in this July run when price got above the cloud and momentum got above the cloud to stay in because it never breached it here 
and you got another second run all the way back up into the 60s. Likewise, Bitcoin's trend, its real trend up, started back in 2020. It was very, very clear. Let me make it more clear. When Bitcoin poked its head out of the cloud, either back in uh, July of 2020 or yet another chance in October of 2020, when it gave you these signs and never really violated the cloud again and went up, that was your sign. And it never came back. All through this whole run up, you never, ever breached the cloud. In fact, the cloud would sometimes provide some dynamic support and resistance. February 21, March of 21, April of 21, and then you got May and boom. So you had a chance to exit Bitcoin. You had a chance to exit Bitcoin here in May of 2021 when it went out. So cut your Bitcoin here. Save yourself the July and then wait, wait out the FUD, and then you could have got back in at the same price when it came back up again. And then as price went up, you didn't miss out. You didn't have to FOMO. And you got where you were able to catch this thing on the way back up. Now, what happened on December, one year ago this week, you got your signal that, okay, I need to be out of Bitcoin again. I need to get out of Bitcoin. And that was the point you should have gotten out. You should have gotten out, I hate to say this to you, because it's hindsight, but using this strategy, you should have been out at about 50K Bitcoin. What does that mean now? What does that mean to us now? It's, it's fine to look at history. Well, we were looking for price to get out at the same time as momentum, and it didn't happen. So we didn't go long here. And then we had FTX. So down another leg. Break the June low, create more FUD. So when do we buy Bitcoin again? Well, now that it has set up in such a way, Bitcoin gets bullish when price gets above the cloud. At the same time, momentum gets above the cloud. So this could take another few weeks, naturally. It could take a really big move to get it up to about 20, if it happened really freaking quick. But what you need to start looking at now is basically this level right here, this 50% level is going to become very, very critical because this is the 50% move on the daily from this FTX FUD. Bitcoin is very, very likely, you know, over the next few days and weeks, you know, it's already, look at this, it's already handled its, uh, its little Tinkinson recapture right here. Remember where I talked about earlier in the live stream where you get a little pullback up here you get this underside uh, Tinkinson to get underneath you, that little mini 50% of the move. Or, you know, you can see a lot easier if you go down to, you know, a lower time frame. You know, there was some good opportunities in here. Now what you're looking at, what you can assume, is that you're going to get a retrace, an attempt to try to get up to this 50% level. So if you're trying to catch a swing trade long on Bitcoin, I think you're doing a good thing. Hashtag disclaimer, I'm not soliciting it by ourselves. But when it gets up to this level, you need to be really, really critical. This is a trader's market. This is not a, a hodler's market. Okay, I'm talking trading here. So you need to be very deft. You need to be very nimble. You need to be willing to take some profit and then see what happens before you start jumping in. So what you want to see once you get in, get out, is for you then to get a daily bar up above the cloud and then once your momentum gets back above the cloud too, so we're talking about 18,800, uh, 19,000, let's call it. If we can get back into here after a certain amount of time to make this all set up the way it needs to, then you now have an official bullish trend. And I'm going to post about it if and when that happens. So that's the current state of Bitcoin right now. This week, was it this week? Uh, what day is that? Yeah, Monday. Monday of this week, Bitcoin came down and uh, it came down, got itself a little bit of support on Monday, and boom. Now, let me, let me sit back in my chair here and talk a little bit about external indicators of Bitcoin, okay? So 
As I said earlier, I went to a Bitcoin barbecue meetup, just a social event with Bitcoin uh, yesterday. We had a definite bear market turnout. Uh, that means just our closest friends we've known for almost a decade were there, under 15 people. It's, it's very interesting when that happens. We've seen it happen many times in many cycles. Um, doesn't necessarily mean a bottom, but we're getting there because only the hardest of core are still remaining. I like to hang around in Bitcoin Maxi chat rooms. And back in June, when we had this dip, even with Celsius and everything going crazy and people losing money, people were still very optimistic arrogant, even if you will, that, aha, I'm going to stack some more sats. With this move down, those chat rooms have gone silent. Fear has actually taken over. I think a lot of people are getting there or close to their, wor their worst, worst, worst possible projected liquidation points. You know, you got you to kind of think back to, if you, if you weren't paying attention, but there's this, there this mood back around 40, the 40K range, I remember specifically, was like, okay, it's going to be okay. I knew there was going to be volatility in crypto. You know, it's fine. It's fine, everybody. I accepted the risk. You know, people were okay to accept the risk at 40K. They were okay for it to come from 60 down to 40 because they probably bought about 30. You know, they probably were really, really smart cookies and, you know, bought it, you know, here you know, in the run-up in 2021, they were probably pretty smart. They, they, they knew what they were doing. They, they, they were really good with risk. They did not think this was going to happen. Or this. So now fear has actually kind of started to settle in. And so now Bitcoin is starting to get cheap. I have to say that. So be aware of what's going on through this weekend and next week, this is going to be basically your key level. SG, SG, uh, what strategy? Because I just went over my strategy for trading Bitcoin like 10 minutes ago. So kind of scroll back in the, uh, the live stream and, and watch that because I just went through the whole thing <laughs> right now. So... Yeah. Oh, and also, um, there's another little niche thing that I'm looking for. Uh, bottom call, an, another indicator. I'm looking for Michael Saylor to get liquidated. You know, a couple of 13F filings ago, he back when back when Bitcoin was around 30k, back in this range, he was still announcing that his financials. He said something to the effect of, um, or he published uh, that. Um, and maybe I need to do a video on MicroStrategy and build up some of that FUD. Um, I really dislike him because of him telling people to mortgage their houses and businesses to buy Bitcoin uh, in the 60s. You know, he was going on a podcast circuit telling, giving people horrible financial advice. A lot of people that followed him lost money. I, I don't abide that. I hate mm. – that's one of the reasons I'm very hesitant to, like, tell people what to do, what to buy. I don't want to do that because I don't want people to come back and say – you said do this, and he actually went on a circuit telling people to buy Bitcoin you know, in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, he's a bad person in my eyes because he was basically just talking his position, getting people to pump his books. It's a really bad thing to do. So I'm looking for him to get liquidated because it's going to make for a great documentary about what great follies in the history of finance. So his margin call, that they used to publish back here when it was in the 30s and things were kind of okay, he said at about 21K, he would have to post more collateral for his loans. His billions in Bitcoin are bought on borrowed money. Some of it's secured at low rates, and some of it is in floating rates. I think it's like about a, I don't want to misquote, most of his debt is at a fixed rate. I don't want to misquote. I need to do a video on this. Uh, but most of his debt is at a fixed rate. It's okay. It's locked in at probably around 6%. The other 25% roughly is uh, in a floating rate, which means that as interest rates go up, uh, he's going to have a harder time servicing that interest-only debt. His company doesn't make money. They lose money every quarter. So they don't have revenue to service the debt. 
we'll see what happens. But just imagine if he's forced to liquidate his 130,000 Bitcoin. Imagine what that's going to look like on the chart if, you know, half a percent, small, but if, if a big portion of Bitcoin has to be sold into the market or that won't even, it won't even wait that long. Once he announces that he's going bit out, of, out of business, then people know that that Bitcoin is coming onto the market. It's going to go down. And so that liquidation point, that big spike on him getting liquidated, wherever it comes, is going to be a major buy signal for Bitcoin because the, the most prominent messiah and prophet of the Bitcoin maxis is going to be taken out he lost his clients a ton of money in the dot-com bust. Everyone's forgotten that. And he was a huge anti-Bitcoin person back in 2013. He's a shill, and I don't respect him, and I want to see him lose. And if he does, I'll buy his Bitcoin from him. That's what I'm waiting for. But for now, in case I'm wrong, you can watch the charts. So I'm going to start wrapping up. Anything... Good. I'm glad. I clearly do not understand what you're talking about. Okay. Go back and watch it a little bit. And um, watch the video. Send me a message. Um, better yet, hop on the Discord in the link and ask me, hey, can you do a quick recap? I can probably find you the video. You know, I haven't done a, a, a Ichimoku video in a long time. Um, actually, hold on a second. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Let, let me give you something here. Um, so I want you to uh, go to... I want to post these in the chat for you. This strategy goes over my uh, Ichimoku Cloud Breakouts. But more to the point, I did this research on the different Ichimoku numbers. Um, which one I think is better, the better crypto numbers or the classic numbers. And I did a deep dive into like 12, uh, 10 years, going back to 2012, of using this strategy on the daily chart to see would you have been better off just holding, trading in and out with classic Ichimoku numbers or trading with the new and improved Ichimoku numbers and watch that video and uh, if I went back and did the results with the benefit of all of 2021 ahead of us um, it's still correct it's still the classic numbers but go back to watch those videos if you have questions come ping me on discord or trading view I'm happy to talk to people. As you can tell, I love talking about this stuff. So as I wrap up, does anybody have anything else they want to discuss? I didn't even get to my notes. I kind of did. No, I didn't. I didn't get to uh, my fluff stuff. Okay. Real quick then, I really feel obliged to need to talk about the other cryptos that I do like, which is, of course, Ethereum. Um, Ethereum is another one that I think that if, I mean, look, I've got these other cryptos on my watch list right here because friends of mine have really, really wanted me to uh, talk about them or watch them. Um, so I keep an eye on them. But the three things that I really care about is Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Monero. And Bitcoin, because it's Bitcoin, it's kind of a tautology. You got to watch it. Ethereum, because, hey, it's, a, it's got a lot of use cases. It's really kind of the lead player in smart contracts and whatever smart contracts are going to do and mean. Uh, there's all these chains that try to do it better than Ethereum, but if we know anything from the VHS Betamax history and other history of technology, better is not also often uh, more widely used. Uh, sometimes the inferior product is used because it's just more popular. So you got to watch Ethereum. And then Monero. Monero is, frankly doing better than Bitcoin all year long. This is Monero versus Bitcoin. So in other words, uh, it's a current, it's a cross pair. You know, Monero going up means this goes up. Bitcoin going down means that uh, hold on. Monero going up is this way and Bitcoin going up would be, would be down. They're inverse to each other. 
And so what this is, is how they trade against each other. Basically, uh, you divide Monero, or excuse me, divide Bitcoin by Monero, and you get 0 0.0084. It's the exchange rate between them. And so over the course of this year, over the course of this year, 2021, 2022, wow, we're already in 2023, and I'm about to mess up that up. So, oh, I need the info line. So, January 1st, we're even just going to go here for January 1st in this upswing. There's a 72% difference. So, in other words, there's a 72% difference in if you would have had Monero instead of having Bitcoin, you would have a greater value. Now, both have gone down. Both Monero from, I've already got it here. Let me take off Ichimuku and make this clear. So, from January the 1st, uh, well, let's change this up. M Monero is down 22% year to date. Bitcoin, year to date, let me find January 1st, oh, up here. January 1st, down to here, Bitcoin is down 64%. So, Monero is down only 22%, Bitcoin is down 64%. Monero has been a better store of value. And I've been watching this and talking about it every single live stream. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do a quick recap of the SPX here in a second. Um, I've been watching this for many, many months now, trying to tell people, look, Monero is a privacy-based coin. It does privacy better than Bitcoin because Bitcoin is not private. Monero is privacy by default. And as more and more regulation starts to come in, which a lot of people are welcoming, especially with the whole FTX debacle coming about, I'll tell you something. It's not a good thing, but the hackers are taking notice to all these seizures. The hackers are taking notice to the fact that they're probably going to get caught if they steal Bitcoin. But you can't trace Monero, at least in any way that I know about. Maybe they've hacked it. I don't know. But it's definitely less hackable than Bitcoin, which is pretty transparent. You go on the dark web now, and this is the currency of choice. It's the same use case that Bitcoin was a decade ago. It's having anonymous transactions on the Internet. It's not a popular thing to say. It's a very contrarian thing to say. But Monero, even in price, even if you're an investor, it's doing better. It's doing better. It's better than Bitcoin. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, but just keep watching this chart. Keep watching the performance of Monero versus Bitcoin. Even as we're in this bear market, it's holding its ground better. You have more fiat relative wealth today holding Monero than holding Bitcoin. Now, I'm not saying don't hold anything else. But, you know, you came to this live stream to get my view and what I try to see. And this is what I see. That's why I share it with you guys. So SPX, um, I tend to use uh, the S&P 500 futures, uh, KV, Carex, um, just because I trade 24 hours a day, and I trade them uh, live, day trading. But SPX, of course, we can look at. I'll tell you what the main thing going on in the SPX that I look at is this. Um, you mentioned a uh, moving average. Uh, I like to use retracement levels. And the main retracement level I use, I don't use all the Fibonacci's and stuff like that. Um, which crypto exchange do I recommend? Uh, you can't buy Monero on Coinbase. No one should do any business with Coinbase anyway. Uh, they're kind of at the forefront of ruining crypto. Uh, Kraken, K-R-A-K-E-N, is the U.S.-based tie your bank account to them exchange that I would recommend. Um, outside of the U.S., if you were to, uh, you know, use a very popular nothing, you can probably find some non-KYC exchanges, but I'm not going to mention them here. So, but if you want to just start buying Monero, uh, Kraken is going to be your choice because Jesse Powell, even though he stepped down as CEO, He's a great guy. I met him years ago. Probably doesn't remember me, but you know he 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 has some pretty based libertarian tweets. I like him still. Anyway, going back to your thing, uh, KB. Um, 
I know this is a little, this is not really to the modern time, but essentially what you had was from the COVID low to the all time high in January this year. Um, we pulled back in October to that 50% retracement. We had a really awesome, awesome spike. This is SPX, SPY, whatever you look at. On that October CPI print, a fake out right here, which has really triggered this move up. And so now we're coming up right here. So the SPX getting support above the 200 dynamic moving average right at the weekly trend line. Okay, so that is not something that I use, but um, what I am looking at is this. Um, what I would look at is the retracements, basically 50% moves. And so if we go from the all-time high down to here, if we say that this is the level, and you can actually start to see some uh, support, or excuse me, resistance here. Um, prior support, in other words, here's the spike on the lows of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, which honestly faked me out. I thought this was the buy the dip moment. It was not. It's okay. And then we held it here, came back here. Uh, 41.55 is, is where I'm going to get really interested in the resistance. Um, that is, of course, going to be pretty much the same on SPY, I imagine. Let's just double check that, make sure I am correct. Yeah, 41.4. I've really been thinking SPX um, 4200, but probably a little less. Let's, let's call it uh, 41.5 or 41.50. And then, of course, on the ES, uh, that number, I think it is going to be um, somewhere in that range. Yeah, 41.55. That's what I'm kind of looking at. And I was talking about this very early into the live stream. Go go back to the beginning of the live stream uh, where I really started looking at um, the different, the NASDAQ versus this. Uh, the VIX is also at a support level. Uh, it's at 20. You can see where VIX tends to invert from that level. And volatility and everything starts to kind of uh, uh, be kind of, inversely correlated to each other. Uh, Luxuro, if you go back about uh, 25 minutes uh, in the live stream, you'll see a whole rundown about Bitcoin that can be very useful to your question. So I'm kind of coming to the end right here. But yeah, just go back, scroll back to about like uh, 20 minutes ago. And uh, I got your answer there for Bitcoin because somebody asked that earlier. Um, I would like it if uh, TradingView would tell me, you know, like, when people are kind of joining and stuff, because it could be that I need to just plan to have um, longer live streams. Uh, but also, I don't want to repeat myself for the people that have been watching since the beginning. So anyway, uh, so you have the S&P uh, coming back up to that level right there, which again, you can see where it was a key event back in February. Uh, it was the top in June. You had a test of it back here in September. So yeah, 4155 is like, mm, mm, mm. it's, you, you got to be watching and we're, we're not far away from it. And it's almost like there's a gravitational force that's probably going to pull us up to that level. But when it gets there, you need to get a little defensive. Um, the NASDAQ has already hit uh, a level this week that I talked about earlier on in the live stream, um, where it's the August high down to here. I mean, this was basically boom, it hit it in November. Boom, it hit it here. Really good day trading opportunities to play this resistance, um, So especially this week. Uh, but then the NASDAQ, it's likewise full trend from its all-time high uh, down to uh, the October low. Uh, it's going to be somewhere around the top 13,600. I got to assume, because this is so much farther away, um, that uh, we're probably going to not hit here. I'd say that probably we're going to be dominated by the SPX or ES hitting its resistance first. So I get really, really interested um, as we start to come up to here. And you know what? We got we may have a Santa Claus rally coming up. I would say this more likely we're going to have a Santa Claus rally this year because no one has been talking about it. I mean, people have mentioned it, but you don't have Kramer going on and uh, making a big tweet storm about it like he did, which then led to people making fun of him when we uh, did not get it. But it is December. Statistically speaking, more times than not, you get um, a lot. But uh, yeah, Dexter, um, whatever do you mean?
by Mount Gox expectation is um are you talking about some news event there? Uh what do you mean? I'm curious. Tell me. Mount is this uh is this a ticker? Mount Gox is something I could definitely talk about. I mean, I, I was around back then, but no, I, yeah. 140,000 Bitcoin net need Ned to given. Hold on. Help me out. Help me out here. So, uh, Mt. Gox 140k BTC. Okay, Google. Thank you, Google. Will Mt. Gox release the one? Okay, okay. So, this they found this and it's in the settlement. Man, let's talk about a long time. Um, let's bring this up right here. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting point. Uh, the Mt. Gox hack was a watershed moment. Um, so, yeah, so basically I bet the, the bankruptcy creditors, uh, the, the trustees probably, so they've got about 140,000 Bitcoin. Okay. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you this about just the kind of general mantra of markets. It's probably priced in. Okay. The reason you had such a big move here was the complete unexpectedness of um, FTX collapsing. Just like in June, you had the complete unexpectedness of Celsius co collapsing. Um, if we know that it's going to happen in January and it does happen, I don't think it's going to surprise many people. I don't think it's going to come as a shock. Now, they could come out and say that something crazy happened and they just dumped it onto the market. But typically in these kind of scenarios, like when the government uh, has seized you know, Bitcoin, um, they usually put it off at a very, uh, at like kind of a private auction where they let major hedge funds, uh, major heavily capitalized individuals uh, bid on it. And these don't go out to the open market because they really usually don't want to take the time to sit there and like put in a bunch of, you know, sell orders um, for that much Bitcoin. They'd rather just, you know, negotiate a price, which is typically going to be below market price because they're buying in bulk and just have it done. That's typically what tends to happen in seizure situations. Uh, but in this case, it's probably done by, you know, creditors. They may want to get the best price. I don't know. Um, but yes, that is probably a little bit of FUD that is weighing over uh, the industry. Um, it's a big bunch of Bitcoin. That's for sure. It's, about, it's a little more than even Michael Saylor has. Uh, so, man, that, uh, it's an interesting prospect. Let's say that you know they dump the 140K. Well, they're not going to dump it on the, the open market. I really don't think so. Um, someone's going to buy it. Someone out there is going to buy that in a big lump sum probably or multiple people. Um, it's not going to go on an exchange. I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, but I don't know. It's interesting to watch for, that's for sure. But, uh, yeah, uh, if you want to talk more about it, join me next week, and uh, we will. So thank you, everybody, for spending your Friday evening uh, with me. And I will be back uh, next week. Have a good weekend, and uh, trade wisely. We'll see you next time.